Can you hear me? There we go. I hear myself now. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm so pleased that you could join us this evening. I'm Maria Gallo, Chancellor here at UW River Falls. I'm going to begin uh, with reading our land acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin River Falls sits on the shared ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe and the Dakota nations and tribal communities. Acknowledging our university's historical contributions to the disenfranchisement of indigenous communities, we declare a standing commitment towards campus-wide education, increased awareness of current indigenous issues, and the development of sustainable partnerships with indigenous nations of the area. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to acknowledge the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership, which has generously sponsored our speaker and associated events. The Thompson Center seeks to support activities across all UW campuses to inform and inspire current and future public leaders, foster leadership skills, and promote effective public leadership. The center offers free public events, funds research and scholarships, and honors exemplary public leaders. On behalf of UW River Falls, my heartfelt thank you to the Thompson Center and its staff who have helped make this event possible. I'm excited for you to hear from our presenter. The reason is that I've been involved in advocating for gender parity for years. Many of you know that I serve as the chair of the American Council on Education's Women's Network Executive Council in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to help women advance to the highest levels of leadership in higher education across the nation. From this work, I know that women still have a long way to go to reach parity in the C-suite, despite surpassing men for more than a decade in college completion and degree attainment. So there's still much work to be done to eliminate barriers to leadership faced by women. But what has been happening to men in education in the meantime? The gender imbalance clearly manifests itself in current college enrollments. The National Student Clearinghouse Research Center reports 60% of American universities and colleges are comprised of women. 50 years ago, the gender proportions were reversed. And right here at UW River Falls, we are 65% women, 35% men. So from these stats, it's been evident that women are dominating in education. I've been curious about this trend and expressed this to my colleagues, including our UW River Falls Foundation Chair, Dave Drewski, who's here tonight. So last winter break, he messaged me about a book that addressed this issue and others that are playing out in our country. I immediately ordered it. That's really the benefit of Amazon and those kind of online things. I immediately ordered it, got it a few days later. I was impressed with the data presented, fascinated by the arguments that were made, and interested in the solutions proposed. The book is Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It, by our speaker, Richard Reeves. Richard's work details how changes in society have combined to form an environment in which a growing number of males perform poorer in many areas than their female counterparts. Richard advocates for changes that will improve conditions for boys and men to do better while also ensuring that girls and women continue to make strides towards e equality. Richard is a highly acclaimed best-selling author and thinker. He is founder and president of the new American Institute for Boys and Men, which he states is a credible, research-based, non-ideological organization dedicated to understanding and improving the lives of boys and men. And he is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., where he previously directed the Future of the Middle Class Initiative and the Center on Children and Families. I'm sure you will be intrigued by what Richard has to say, and I invite you to ask questions following his presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Richard Reeves. Thank you, Chancellor Gallo. Can everybody hear me okay? It's working great. Thank you, Ben. 
Uh, and let me thank you for the invitation and our sponsors, and Beth Schommer as well for all the work you've done to, to make this happen. I really appreciate it. I feel very welcome uh, on campus. It's my first time here, so uh, I'm loving getting to know some of you all. As you can tell, in case you didn't already know uh, from my accent, I live in East Tennessee. <laughs> I actually do live in East Tennessee. That's not a joke. I've moved to East Tennessee about three, three years ago from Washington, DC. I spent 10 years there as a think tanker. And before that, I was in the UK government. Um, I've raised three boys. You'll hear a little bit about them uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and as a social scientist, I've worked mostly on issues of inequality, racial justice, social mobility, et cetera. Uh, and so that's led me to the work that you just had a, a preview of some of what I'm going to say. Um, but I think it's important just to underline, I think, the framing that Chancellor Gallo's already given us, which is to invite everybody to move beyond zero-sum thinking. It can simultaneously be true that there is much more to do on behalf of women and girls. For example, only 25% of members of Congress are women. Still single-digit CEOs of Fortune 500 companies at the last count, as far as I'm aware, yet to have a female president, which at this point is becoming close to a, an international embarrassment, in my view. In fact, it took me a long time growing up in the UK to discover that men could be prime minister. I was born in uh, 1969, uh, and so like all I'd known was Margaret Thatcher and Queen Elizabeth, um, and so it came as a bit of a shock to me um, when we had a man following her. Uh, and so it just kind of shows you how far behind we are on some of these things. And one, there's lots of data points I could share. We'll give you one more, which is that only about 2% of the venture capital money going to startup companies goes to female founders. Uh, and I know that particularly person because uh, I'm married to a woman who is currently trying to raise money from VC funds as a female founder. And so that particular statistic is one that's raised on a daily basis in our house. Whenever I go to give a speech, just don't forget to tell them about the venture capital money. <laughs> so if there are any venture capitalists in the room, please come up to me afterwards. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to do. Um, but as I'm going to argue tonight, there's also a number of issues now where the disproportionate problems seem to be on the other side of the equation where it seems to be boys and men that are struggling on various fronts in terms of mental health, education, and so on. And so if we are able to pay ourselves the compliment that we can think two thoughts at once, if we think that institutional leaders and policymakers are able to do two things at once, then that will get us beyond the zero-sum framing that I think has made it so difficult even to discuss these issues in a way that is fact-based, that is solutions-forward, and that in no way diminishes the ongoing work we have to do on the other side of the equation. And so that's the kind of framing that I'm going to be using tonight. And I'm going to try and use a little bit less of the time than I was allocated, if possible, just so that we have time for, for questions. I, I just got a sense from the energy in the room that we could probably just go to Q&A now, actually, is my <laughs> sense of it. But, um, but I'll, I'll at least go through the kind of rigmarole of showing you some slides first. Um, I have slides. I have charts. I'm from the Brookings Institution. This is a, a university campus, so you have to forgive me that there are, quite, there are some charts coming. Um, uh, I get the sense of the kind of audience that likes charts, but just in case I'm not, I'm sorry, it's late in the day. I am still a scholar at heart, and a Brookings Institution scholar. We get anxious if we don't have charts. <laughs> like the idea that we could present without charts. You know, my wife would say, how was your day? And I'd say, well, what do you mean? Median, mean, standard deviation, be more precise. And if you just follow me on Twitter, you wouldn't have to ask every evening. <laughs> Think how much time could be saved over the dinner table if partners just followed each other on social media. <laughs> so I'm going to go through some stats. But first of all, I think this is the right question, right? <clears throat> Not only the book, which I'm going to talk about, but also just go about the, but this. The American Institute for Boys and Men launched yesterday. I was in Seattle yesterday for an event. Our website literally only, only went live in the last matter of hours, a day or so. Uh, and so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this guy looked across the world, looked at what's happening in society, and said, you know what we need? Another think tank. <laughs> right. I've worked in think tanks. But on this occasion, I do think we need a new think tank that's 
research-based, fact-based, etc. So I'm, 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 I'm proud and a little bit nervous about this new adventure. I've, I, I'm still a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings, but I've left the, the rather comfortable berth of the Brookings Institution to, to create this startup. So I'll share a URL at the end. It's AIBM.org, so it's quite easy. Um, and I'd encourage you to kind of follow our work and just challenge us where appropriate. But so back to this question, why, really? Given all the things I've just mentioned about women and girls, why? Why would you focus on, why should we have this discussion about boys and men, write books about boys and men, uh, set up think tanks on boys and men? I mean, I mean, no, really, really, why? And I think if that's the reaction that people are having, I think if there's this sense of like, really? Hang on, what about some of the stats we just talked about or other things? Not only is that a understandable reaction, it's an honorable reaction, and one that, frankly, I sometimes feel myself in my own work. My own work very often creates quite a lot of cognitive dissonance because some of the things you discover don't fit with your prior views of the world. They're inconvenient. They're uncomfortable. But if our work only ever makes us comfortable and we're scholars, then I would humbly suggest that we're very bad scholars indeed. The idea that the world will always comport itself in alignment with our pre-existing opinions is a very scary one indeed. And honestly, I kept finding some of this data. I thought, really? Is that true? Questioning it. And what does that mean about my own commitments? And what does it mean about what I should do? So really, why? Well, it's not like there haven't been books about this before. And those of you who've been you know, studying this field or following it for a while know Hannah Rosen wrote this book, The End of Men, based on an Atlantic article 10 years ago. This is a slightly more conservative book from Kay Heimowitz, uh, Manning Up. This is Zimbardo and uh, Coulomb's book. This is Man Out by Andrew Yarrow, published by the Brookings Institution Press, my same press as me, just three or four years before my book. The Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell and John Gray. Some of you know these books by looks of it. And then actually since my book has come out, this one came out. This is by uh, Senator Josh Hawley. Does everybody know who Senator Josh Hawley is? If you don't, I just have to do this and you'll let me know who I'm talking about. Um, the junior senator from Missouri uh, became famous for uh, that, that photograph. Um, he, in his book, is actually, he engages with my work a little bit. He's criti critical of what I'm about to, I'm going to argue for later, which is that we should have a really strong push to get more men into caring professions. Uh, he thinks that that's, that that's trying to turn men into something that they're not rather than create an economy that works for men as they are. That's the nature of his criticism. I have responded to him. Um, I don't know him at all. We haven't engaged personally. But nonetheless, there are a number of books from different political perspectives that are kind of getting at this question. Uh, and so it's in the air um, for sure. So why, why, why me? What, what am I doing? Well, so there's the, there's the plug for the book. Um, so I'm just waiting for you all to get your phones out and order it on Amazon. Ah, you've all already bought it. Um, remember, I've got two kids in college. In fact, two of them are here. So this is the other reason I've written the book. These are my three sons. Uh, and the reason I'm not in the photograph is not because they're all taller than me now. Um, only two of them are taller than me. I'm a little bit, well, actually, I don't know. They might all be taller than me. So, and this is actually in North Wales, where my, my mother grew up um, recently. So they've been raised in the UK and the US. And the conversations about being a boy, what, some of the challenges have been dinner party, dinner table conversations. Right? Now, I'm not going to suggest for a moment that boys who look like this, who've been raised in homes like mine, are the ones who are most struggling in the modern economy or even in the education system. Right? That's not going to be my claim, as you'll see in a moment. But nonetheless, it has, it has been a discussion uh, at home. But then as a social scientist, I've been running across some of the data points I'm about to share with you. And this is trying to amplify the point about the need for empirical rigor and honesty. This is a quote from C.P. Scott, who's the founder of the Guardian newspaper in the UK. I spent a few years as a Guardian newspaper journalist. And he said this, comment is free. That's still the actual title for the opinion pages of the Guardian, comment is free. And that's where it comes from, this quote. But facts are sacred. And I think just being able to share facts, comfortable or uncomfortable, understandable or hard to understand, even if we disagree about the interpretations of those facts, just actually grounding ourselves in a better understanding of what's really going on is important. And I didn't feel there's enough of that going on with regard to boys and men. 
for institutional reasons, for incentive reasons, for personal reasons, and for reasons that we just, it was just uncomfortable. You'd be like, oh, that's interesting. So I noticed, for example, in the first year of COVID, that the male college enrollment rate dropped seven times more than the female one. And I noticed it in Appendix 3 of the NCES report. I'm like, wait, what? And I showed it to some colleagues who work in higher education. I said, did you know this? I went, no, I don't think I'd noticed that. And no one had drawn attention to it. It wasn't seems that big a deal. So, mm, probably, that might be a big deal. Turns out there's all kinds of complexities around that. But nonetheless, that was true. And similarly, when I started looking at, like, death rates from COVID, I couldn't help but noticing that a lot more men were dying from COVID. And I looked around for who was doing the work on it. There wasn't really, anybody, there wasn't really anybody doing any work on that. I ended up doing work on it, and I'm very far from being a public health economist. But it was quite hard to get people to, to just notice that. Um, and again, it might be for all kinds of complicated reasons, but nonetheless, even to this day, people look at me quizzically when I say, you do know that we lost twice as many middle-aged men as middle-aged women to COVID, right? Uh, and 100,000 more men overall. People are like, oh, really? And I think it's just, again, because it's, just not, it's not comfortable for us to talk about the gender gaps that run that way. It's not that there weren't other things about COVID that might have been particularly bad for women, especially in the initial shocks around the labor market, but two things can be true at once. Right? And COVID was, was bad for men. And it's quite interesting for me because I just couldn't quite get people to just look at the data, frankly. I'm like, is this data right? Or, or am I reading the data? So some data coming. And there's some quite troubling data coming. Um, so I'm going to share some statistics for you on suicide rates. And this is showing you the suicide rates for women of these different age groups. And the beginning of the arrow is um, 1999. Should, uh, this is a new chart. We haven't labeled it properly yet. We've just changed our format, so I apologize. And then the end is, um, is 2022. Every single life that's lost to suicide is a tragedy not only obviously for the individual, but for everybody around them, their communities, their families. And I'd, that's probably not a point that needs particularly underlining right here and right now. Every single life. And last year, the US lost 50,000 lives to suicide. More than we lost to car deaths from car accidents. And as you can see, it's risen uh, these are out of 100,000, rates out of 100,000 for these different um, ages of, of women. So it's risen for women and teen girls. And there are other dimensions of mental health among young women and teen girls that have risen much more sharply. Reported anxiety, levels of sadness, suicidal ideation, by some measures attempts at suicide, etc., all risen over the last decade or so for young women as well. So nothing that I'm going to say here should in any way be interpreted as trying to distract attention from those. They've also gone up from higher rates for men. So these are the male rates. Same age groups, same time frame, last two decades. Uh, and so you can see they've risen for, and um, particularly for uh, young men and middle-aged men, uh, in the last 10 years they've driven up. But these are the kind of, these are the increases that we've seen for these groups. Obviously from a much higher, a higher base than here. So the percent change is actually similar. Right, so it's certainly true to say that suicide rates have risen by about the same for the two groups, but just in very different bases. So obviously the absolute effects are much greater. So of that 50,000 that I mentioned um, from last year, 40,000 were, were male. Uh, men account for about 80% of suicide deaths at all age groups. And the rise was most significant in the first part of this century from 2000 to 2010 up to the recession was much greater among middle-aged men. So this chart does the whole range. But it, since, since about 2010, it's been younger men with particularly sharp rises among those aged 15 to 24 and 25 to 34. So a fourfold difference in the risk of suicide. And I came across some work by an Australian researcher, Fiona Shand, who Try to, try to understand this, what's happening, particularly there, there's very, very different research literatures around suicide by gender, but asking men specifically. And the two words that men use to describe themselves in their last communications and before taking their lives from suicide, the two words were useless and worthless. 
Now, of course, that's a tragic example of selection of the people who are in that position. But it was a much more mixed picture for the women. For men, it seems as if a sense of being surplus to requirements, being useless and worthless. Again, this is not new. Anybody knows the literature knows from Death of a Salesman that tragically, Loman comes to the conclusion that he's worth more to his family dead than alive. So this is not new, but the rise and the steepness of the rise is. Uh, and so there's something going on here that we all need to understand and just get our heads around. And as I said, I just don't think that's getting quite enough attention yet. So I started with that, but I'm going to back up now into a field where, so that's mental health. We have a, a brief out on our website, AIBM.org, which, which unpacks all of those trends I've just described for you over age. And, by, and we also cut by age trends. We, do, we have work coming out by race as well. But education, and some of this, you've had a preview of this already. So let's start with this. This shows you for every 100 men how many women were getting college degrees. So back in 1971, 72, up to today, uh, orange is bachelor's and blue is postgraduate. And what you can see is that back in 72, 71, there's a you know, decent size gap in favor of men. Uh, you can see the overtaking, and then you can get to about here. It's actually kind of leveled out. Most of the increase was actually in these earlier decades for women. But now it's kind of leveled out. It's rising a little bit here. And this is only up to 2019. And then things got difficult because of COVID. But the basic message is here is that this gap here is a little bit bigger than the gap here. 1972 was the year we passed Title IX, uh, the legislation to, su to support women and girls in, in education, obviously in athletics, but in other ways too. We now have a slightly bigger gap than we did then. So it's about 15 points in favor of, um, in favor of women now versus men as a relative share compared to what it was in 72. So we have slightly more gender inequality, if I can use that word, on college campuses, to college campuses today than we did in 1972, but it's the other way around. We've seen a complete reversal. Now, these are just facts. How we interpret them, why we're going to get into, does it matter? Maybe, maybe that mattered more than that for reasons we could get into, but these are the facts. And then just, we've already had a, a hint of this, and I'm grateful to be able to, to sort of dig in some of your data, but this shows you the enrollment, student enrollment rates for the uh, UW system as a whole, which tilts female, but then River Falls. And you already heard the data, two-thirds female. Um, that's in line with, th these are in line with national trends. Actually, some of the, the regionals are typically tilting a little bit more female, so it's not unusual in that sense. And again, it, a lot of it depends on which particular schools are the biggest, uh, so we have to be careful about that. But it's important, it's not just about enrollment, it's also about completion. And again, I'm showing here at the bottom, the UW system, these are the six-year graduation rates by gender, and then for the, the same for, for this campus here. And so what you can see is higher graduation rates for women compared to men as well. Uh, about 10-point gap on some measures. So it, it looks to me as if we go back to this chart here, this is just overall college degree acquisition. And it looks like about half of it comes from the en lower enrollment rates of boys and men, and about half of it comes from the lower completion rates of boys and men, even conditional on enrolling. And then again, one of the things that sort of led me down this path, and you have these little moments that you're like, oh, oh, hold on, and uh, obviously they accumulate. So I'm reading a New York Times article about um, judging colleges' completion rates. So this kind of number. And it was uh, done in collaboration with Matthew Chingos, who was a researcher, education researcher I knew quite well. And I was just reading through it, and about paragraph eight, they said, whilst judging colleges for their completion rates, we control for various factors. All right, so they're controlling because they want to judge you fairly, including, and they listed a bunch of the battery of controls, so Pell, high school GPA, et cetera, and gender. I'm like, wait, what? Hold on, hang on. Wait, you're controlling for gender? So I get immediately emailing my chicken and say, what's happening? And he said, well, everybody knows that men are much less likely to complete college. And we, so we can't judge a college, its completion rates, unless we control for gender. So, and that's a moment where you think, uh, did I miss when that became a standard statistical control in these things? Maybe I did. And maybe it's, maybe it's fine, by the way. Maybe that's a fine thing to do, is to control for that. But I just think that's an interesting moment where it's just taken so for granted. And in fact, if you do control for all the other things that are in there, being male is the biggest risk factor for dropping out of college or not completing. So it's not just that I think 
We've got to get more men onto college campuses, but we've got to do a better job of helping them get through to completion. At least half the challenge is on the campus and not just what happens before that. However, what happens before it is very important. So this shows you high school GPA, and it ranks by decile. I did warn you there were charts coming. Uh, I didn't warn you about deciles. But anyway, so the bottom 10% of GPAs over here, of those who are in the bottom 10% of the GPA distribution, two-thirds are male. Over here, the top 10%, two-thirds are female, with a pretty linear relationship in between. So in terms of high school GPA, a very significant gender gap. If you're, an if you're an institution that's largely selecting from here, you know, the slightly better performing high school students measured by GPA, then you're already looking at a market that's about two-thirds female. Right. So in that sense, the, the fact that colleges are, are as gender balanced as they are is quite surprising. And in selective elite institutions, there's a big thumb on the scale now for boys in their admissions chances as they attempt to keep close to gender parity, which is a whole different conversation. There's a very good Times article about that. So you see this big gap in GPA. Now, one consequence of this is that institutions that don't require or encourage the submission of tests results has a big impact on the gender balance. So you, some of you may have heard of this. As there is a, are you, I, I should have checked. Are you test optional here in terms of your admissions? Yeah. And when did you do that? Hmm? A couple, of a couple of years ago, yeah. So that's in, the, that's in line with the trend. It's happened with a few others. So, so if I'm reading the literature correctly, that, might, that gap might get even wider as a result of that decision, which, again, is not to say that's not the right decision. I think there's lots of things to support around test optional. But the, um, the best research on this shows that the main effect of a college going test optional is to increase the, share, the female share by about four percentage points which is not trivial, uh, given, the, given the, what the gap already is. That's work from Vanderbilt. Um, and now, you think about that for a moment, it actually makes perfect sense, because there is no gender gap, really, on SAT and ACT anymore. It's a bit of a slight gender gap. The boys are a little bit ahead on average on SAT. I think ACT is now pretty equal. But there isn't a very big gap. If there's a gap, it's pretty small, right? Whereas you see the one on GPA. And so if you take out the one admissions factor where boys are at least keeping up standardized tests, then it's no surprise that your admissions will start to tilt more female. It's not just GPA, it's also extracurricular activities. Girls do more of that, teacher recommendations, et cetera. So on every measure except standardized tests, girls are ahead of boys. So you take tests out, you're going to skew female. Again, I'm not arguing against the policy. I'm just saying that that's the con one of the consequences of the policy. So we just be careful what we're trying to achieve with, with these different policies. OK, so why? Why this GPA gap? Well, here I'm going to become a uh, psychologist. I'm not a psychologist, as you're about to discover. Are there a, I know there are some psychologists in the room. Hands up who's a psychologist. OK, darn it, I guess. OK, um, so here's my amateur psychology. But this is based on pretty good work from um, Catherine Page Harden, Larry Steinberg, and colleagues. Uh, Shulman, Elizabeth Shulman is the main author on it. So what this shows you is, by age, from preteen here, 10, to mid-20s, girls on the left, boys on the right, two different measures at the average. And those two different measures are sensation-seeking, which is this orange line here, and impulse control, which is the blue line there. Sensation-seeking and impulse control is, are helpfully described by psychologists as being like the the gas and, and the brake in a car, right? Sensation seeking is, that's a great idea, let's try that. Yes, I will, have, I will try your drink. Or yes, it is a good idea to run across the road and then flip ourselves three times over into the snow. Or whatever, right? The night is young, live for the day. Tomorrow can take care of itself, etc. right? Or as Larry Seinfeld famously kind of said, Tomorrow guy can take care of that. I'm today guy. Brilliant philosophical piece of Seinfeld, by the way. Um, that's tomorrow guy's problem, right? So this is what's called, and, and you can see that that sensation seeking really goes up in, in adolescence, right? And meanwhile, the other side is the break, the impulse control is the break. That's the, maybe you shouldn't hurl yourself off that railing. Maybe you shouldn't try that drink. Maybe you shouldn't stay out late. Maybe you should do your homework and get an early night because you've got a chemistry test tomorrow, right? 
And adolescence is a period where we're just struggling a little bit because the sensation seeking is running ahead and the impulse control is going to go. But the main point here is a bit of a difference between the boys and the girls. So the story of this chart is adolescence is a bit of a hot mess, in case that's news to anybody who hasn't been an adolescent or isn't an adolescent. But you can see this huge difference here, where it's just, it just takes the boys a bit longer. The gap's there, it remains. And sometimes when I present this, some people will say, it sounds like you're blaming the boys. Oh, I'm not blaming the boys. This is, these are just, again, it's facts. These are what happens is that the boys' frontal cortex, and this is where I get really in trouble, because now I'm going to be a neuroscientist, frontal cortex develops a little bit later. The frontal cortex is a bit of your brain, it's sometimes called the CEO of your brain, the executive functioning part of your brain, the organizational bit of your brain, the bit of your brain that says it's a good idea to go to bed rather than continue to binge Netflix and eat Ben and Jerry's or whatever, right? It's that bit of your brain. It's the organizational bit. Um, and, and hitting puberty actually triggers the growth of the frontal cortex. It's not the only thing but hitting puberty. And girls hit puberty a year earlier than boys. Their frontal cortex grows a bit earlier than boys. And so their those functionings, non-cognitive functionings, organizational skills, just develop a little bit earlier in girls and boys. Again, not really shocking. Like one of my most, most feminist uh, colleagues, by the way, lifelong ardent feminist right here, she's like, well, duh, in the marginal book, well, duh, because she's got kids of both, thank you. You know, I didn't need a Brookings Institution book to tell me this, thank you. Um, and all the educators are like, well, duh. <laughs> okay, so it's like a well, duh thing. We know that. We know that on the average there are these differences. But if it's so obvious, then should it influence education policy? Maybe. Now, I'm going to argue in a moment that it should. But for the moment, I just want to set out some examples. That's why GPA is so different. Girls are not smarter than boys or the other way around. But girls do get their act together a bit earlier than boys. Right? And, and that turns out to show up in things like GPA. Because GPA rewards turning your homework in. Having taken boys through the high, the high school system in the US, I know from painful personal experience that just turning your homework in makes a massive difference to your GPA. And so the boy would come home and say, did you turn your homework in? Oh, no, I forgot. Well, maybe that's why you've got a 1.9 GPA. So it just rewards those organizational skills, right? It's not cognitive. So not a surprise to see that. I just want to briefly point out that almost all the gaps I'm going to talk about in terms of education are much bigger for black students than they are for white students. Here, for the sake of clarity, I'm just doing black and white. And this just shows you of the share of black students and white students at these different levels, associates, bachelors, masters, doctorate, so black on the left, white on the right. What share of those degrees are going to females in blue or males in orange? And what that shows you is there's a gender gap for white and black. But you can see how much bigger it is for black. For every black man getting a college degree at any level, there are two black women. And in fact, at this level, once you get up to masters in here, that actually there are slightly more young black women now with a postgraduate degree than young white men. And I've come to believe that actually not breaking by race and gender is borderline irresponsible, given we see this such different pattern for black boys. Why is this happening? Well, I've already given you the neuroscientific answer, but I'm going to give you now a more straightforward answer, which is there aren't enough male teachers. This is actually taken from a substack I wrote for Scott Galloway, hence the change in style. This shows you that in 1980, this is the male share of teachers here in dark. In 1980, 33% of K-12 teachers in the US were male. It's now 23%. And it's actually gone down again since I made this chart. So a 10 percentage point drop in the share of male teachers in K-12 classrooms. It doesn't get that much attention when the report comes out. In fact, that's an exaggeration. It doesn't really get any attention. But I've come to believe that's a really big problem. And it's not just that I'm convinced by the evidence that actually male teachers can have lots of positive effects, although the, the, the research, a lot of the research still needs to be done, and we're actually commissioning research on this from our own institute. Um, but actually, just in all ki for all kinds of reasons, I think the lack of men in our classrooms is a problem. Um, and yet, a 10 percentage point drop is not getting all that much attention. And there are no serious policy attempts to remediate through policy. And it's not just that 23% is 10 percentage points less than 33%, right? 
it's that 23% is getting perilously close to a point where it's getting harder and harder to attract men into the profession because it's so gendered. The same is true the other way around. We know from the much better research on women in STEM, where we've still got quite a long way to go, especially in tech, that actually it's quite hard. If something's very gender segregated, it's quite hard to go into that if you're against that grain. It's hard to be the only woman engineer in a class of 30. It's hard to be the only male psychologist in a class of 30. Just, it's just hard, you're going against the grain. Once you get to about 30%, maybe a little higher, it seems like it gets a little bit easier, right? But much below 30%, and, the, and, and, and these social norms start to kick in. You start to think, oh, that's something that men do. Oh, well, that's something that women do. But I want to do it, and I don't fit with that. So there's a discomfort that comes with that. I, my middle son is an early years educator, faced quite a certain amount of stigma around that, is going against the grain, for sure. Um, as he does that, has to explain himself quite a bit um, for what he's doing in just the same way that we used to unthinkingly use the term female lawyer, female doctor. Right? That would be weird to do now given that they're 50-50. But we probably wouldn't hesitate to say male nurse. Right? So just a sense of how much further you need to go. And it's even more skewed by, by age. This is the share of men pre-K, elementary, middle, high, and post-secondary. Now, the post-secondary thing, in terms of overall teachers, is close to parity now, thanks to the work of people like the American Council on Education and the Women's Network. And there's a goal now to get the leadership of colleges up to 50% female. We're at 30% now. So that seems like a long way to go, but rather brilliantly, what the American Council of Education have done is ask institutions to sign a pledge that when they replace their current leader, that they will take this target of gender equity into account. So it's not a promise to appoint a woman to that role, but it's a very strong pre-commitment to trying to do so. When I look at the average age, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, Chancellor, the average age of those in leadership organizations and the share of institutions that have signed that pledge, I think the 50% is in within, within reach. I think we could be there. I think, it happen, I think it could happen quite quickly once it starts to happen. Amazing progress. Are we there yet? No. There's still all kinds of issues about tenure track and difficulties getting tenure and discrimination against women in certain subjects, for sure. But wow, we've made progress. But over here, in elementary, fewer than 10% male. In pre-K and, and in kindergarten, actually, almost no men. In fact, about 2 or 3% of kindergarten teachers are male. I mean, that's a unicorn level, right? To put a sharp point on it, as a share of the occupation, there are at least twice as many women now flying US fighter planes as there are men teaching kindergarten. Now, maybe neither of those matter. I think they both matter. And I am thrilled that the US Air Force is redesigning its aircraft to be more accommodating. It turns out that like the ejector seats and stuff like, they're the wrong shape for most women, right? So, you, sorry, the, you, sorry, you don't fit the seat, was the answer, or you're too short, or whatever, right? So they're redesigning cockpits, they're redesigning things, which will be good, by the way, for a lot of men, too, who didn't fit the sort of standard mold. But they are spending millions of dollars, quite rightly, on making sure that our fighter jets are not inadvertently designed in ways that that prevent women getting them. Great, I'm all about the six or seven percent of women who are flying fighter jets. I think that number could go up. Honestly, if I'm being completely honest, I, all I really care about is can they shoot down the other person's fighter jets? <laughs> if I'm being completely honest. But there's all kinds of reasons why we'd want to care about that. But I care even more about the fact that only two or three percent of our kinder, kindergarten teachers are men. As Gloria Steinem said, we've got to do a much better job now, not only of saying, women can do anything that men have previously done, but men can do things that women have previously done too. And what message do we send to the next generation as these numbers just keep dropping? Like then we hit tipping points. Like if boys come up through an education system where they associate education, teaching, educational excellence with being a girl or a woman, it gets harder and harder to persuade them this actually is for them. And certainly harder to persuade them that teaching is a profession for them when they're just seeing fewer and fewer and fewer men in the classroom. The biggest drops are in high school, even though the number remains there. 
I'm just going to briefly touch, because in the interest of time, uh, I'm skim through these just on a couple of labor market outcomes too. I wanted to spend most of my time on education. Happy to answer questions on anything, of course. But there have been changes in the labor market too. So first of all, this is a horrible chart. I apologize. Um, what this shows you is that most men today earn less than most men did in 1979. This line here, the orange line is median male wages. This is male wages at the 20th percentile. This is men at the top, and then these are women. This shows us two things. Number one, there's been a big increase in wage inequality. Men at the top are still doing quite nicely, thank you. Not true for men in the middle or the bottom. Women at the top have seen very high wage gains, <coughs> smaller wage gains for women at the bottom and the middle, but overall gains. And so part of the problem with this, this is the class, I've mentioned race is a class thing as well. If you spend all your time with affluent, well-educated people in affluent neighborhoods, you're not seeing some of this. Because you don't see the men around you maybe not struggling in quite the same way. They might be struggling in all kinds of other issues, but economically, this is a working class and middle class issue, for sure. It is not for nothing that most men are going to earn less than their fathers did. That's not a trivial economic fact, and therefore maybe not a trivial cultural fact as well. Again, race really matters here. This shows you median wages for white men, white women, black men, and black women. And there is a reason those who are attentive will be, will be realizing there's a tension between the two charts, which I'm happy to address. But you see like white men still earning the most up here. This is, this is uh, median weekly wages. So, and this is showing you the increase. This is 79, this is 2020. This is white women, this is black men, this is black women. So the story here is that back in 1979, the white women were earning a little bit more than black women, but not much. That's been the growth for white women. That's been the growth for black men. White women, for every dollar earned by a white woman, a black man now earns about 84 cents. For every dollar earned by a black man, a, a black woman earns about 94 cents. All right. So whenever people talk about the gender pay gap or the race pay gap, I, I'm always interested in just breaking it down a little bit. And I think it's very easy to miss some of these changes that have taken place. Uh, particularly along these racial lines. Black men have seen very little progress. I've already mentioned what I call heel jobs, so I haven't defined it yet. Heel, health, education, administration, and literacy. And this shows you the share of men in these different occupations. So uh, I've mentioned uh, elementary and middle school teachers. This is 1980, when Reagan came to office, when a third of K-12 teachers were male. And you can see what's happened to the share of men in elementary school teaching. But also look what's happened in psychology and social work. Those weren't female-dominated professions when Ronald Reagan was president, but they are now, and becoming more so. Among psychologists under the age of 30, 5% are men. And so we're gender-segregating these professions at some pace. We're desegregating other professions, thank goodness. The only one that's seen a bit of a rise is nursing. And if there's any economist in the room, you might wonder whether there's any correlation between the fact that these three professions have seen flat or declining real wages and nurses have seen an increase in wages. There may be a connection there. But uh, these numbers really trouble me. So I just think you want diversity of provision. There's a mental health crisis that's affecting boys and girls, men and women, differently but equally. And I think we should, have to, we should make sure that there are providers that look like the people that they're providing for. That includes race, but it also includes gender. I know that when I wanted help with the issues I was struggling with, it really helped me to be able to work with a male therapist. And I know that when one of my sons needed help, my wife and I turned over many, many stones to make sure he could get a male therapist too. Now, maybe we were wrong about our assessment there, but the results seem to suggest we weren't. At least it should be an option. At least it should be available. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about family structure. And here I'm going to also point to another book that's out. My friend Melissa Carney has a book, The Two-Parent Privilege, which is all about marriage, the decline from marriage, rise in single parenthood. Melissa and I agree about a lot of things. We disagree about uh, certain things. And I recommend a podcast out of the University of Tennessee called You Might Be Right that's co-hosted by the last two governors of Tennessee, one Democrat, one Republican. And Melissa and I disagree with each other on that podcast. I, we disagree with how much emphasis she puts on marriage. But I think that when, here's 1919, 2016, this is the share of births that are taking, aside, taking place outside marriage by education of the mother 
So for those with four-year degree, it's now 10% of births to women with a four-year college degree take place outside marriage, compared to 5% in 1990, so doubled. But look at everybody else, associates, etc. Um, the only group where most children are born inside marriage now is college-educated Americans. The majority of other Americans, most of the births are outside marriage. So the default assumption that marriage is going to be institutions which we will raise our kids, I think, is in the rearview mirror. And instead, what we need to focus on is the role of mothers and fathers. And I emphasize very strongly that fathers matter and that you don't have to be a husband to be a good father, that men matter. And this is not in any way, in my view, to be taken as a slight against or an attack on other family forms. And in fact, the same-sex couples who I know who are raising children, most of whom are women, are usually the ones who are quite sensitive about the different kinds of environments that their kids will be in, especially if they have boys. So fathers, very often it is the biological father, and I think you have a responsibility to father if we've had kids, but there's also other fathering, to use a term from the literature on African-American studies, or social fathering, fathers, uncles, neighbors, etc. One of the most striking findings of recent social science from Raj Chetty and his team is that in low-income neighborhoods, they look mostly at black neighborhoods, where there are lots of fathers around, the boys do better, even if their own father's not around. So just having more fathers around seems to help boys, didn't have an effect on girls, boys, even their own. That's speaking to something we can't, we don't know what the causal relationship there is, but it matters. Okay, so anyway, I'm now just gonna run through for the, in the spirit of discussion and solutions, a few ideas. Let's start boys in school a year later. A lot of affluent people do that by default. A lot of private schools effectively have two years. They have two start dates because the boys develop about a year later. That would level the playing field. And it shouldn't just be rich people that can do that. We should have a lot more technical high schools. Turns out that vocational training and education is particularly male friendly. It's true for some girls too, but on the average, vocational education and training seems to actually favor the learning styles of more boys. Um, but we are woefully underinvesting in that. We, need we are the world laggard in apprenticeships in the US. And the apprenticeship bill has been stuck in the Senate for about as long as I can remember. I think I've made this point already, but how do we do that? How do we get more male teachers? Well, how about scholarships for men who want to go into teaching? Now, maybe at this point, you're really just for the men? Yes. If we think it's important to get more men into teaching. Maybe we don't. But if we do, why wouldn't you have scholarships for them? After all, we have many, many scholarships for women going into STEM professions and studying STEM subjects at college. And so we should. But isn't there a similar case? And maybe in some of these other professions too, for incentivizing men into them, if we think it matters? I, I do, but I'd be interested in your reactions. I think college campuses should have men's resource centers on them. There's only two or three I can find. Um, but given the data I've shown on what's happening to men on college campuses, you know, clearly there's more work to be done there. I, I think we should keep the women's resource centers for obvious reasons. But I think there's now a case for investing intentionally in the men on college campuses. I'm seeing a lot of colleges doing that. And I'm, I'm really encouraged by how open many institutions are to at least having the conversation about how do we help our men without doing less for our women. Right? If we can frame it that way, we can make some progress. Um, not only education, but scholarships for men to heal jobs. And could we have paid leave? I recommend six months of paid leave for mothers and fathers. When I first suggested that, everyone was like, what do you think we are, like Finland? <laughs> Kidding, six months? How, are, you, are you really American? I am American, by the way. Really, six months? Okay, I realized at the time it was wildly utopian. Since I published my book, the US military has introduced three months of paid leave for both mothers and fathers. Well, let's start with that, eh? Maybe the civilians could get that too. But very importantly, it should be for fathers as well, on an equal and independent basis. And so with that, I'd love your questions, challenges, thoughts, bits you liked, disliked, etc. Do check out our new website, and thank you for your attention. There is a microphone here for questions. So I think that's the idea, right? Yes, sure, there is a microphone here that we've, uh, we've put in place so that you have to have an embarrassingly long walk <laughs> yeah. 
all the way down while we stare at you. <laughs> I try and fill. And we're here. Hello? It's working. <laughs> Looks like it's on. Oh. I think you probably have to speak right into it. Right into it. Hmm. <laughs> Not working. Try again. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> is it on? Hello, Richard. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name is Eric Withers, and this is awkwardly low. I'm the uh, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Coordinator here mm. at UW River Falls. Um, just want to say thank you first for your work. Uh, just have you know that your work has um, instigated a lot of really awesome conversation over the past week in my classes and other classes. And <coughs> we had a talk uh, about you on Monday about your work, and it went over uh, very well. So oh. yeah, just thank you in general for your work. Thank you. Um, oh, let's stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, it but, if, I if, hope there's a but coming. If my research uh, serves me right, um, the, the wage gap is about 82% mm. women to men. So mm. women make 82% of what men make. Mm. This is across all sectors and age groups and everything like that. Yep. Um, <coughs> however, it has kind of stagnated since like, like two, 2000, 2001, Until 2002. the last year. It's now 84. Oh, it's gone up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in, about in around 2000, it was 80. <coughs> Mm -hmm. cents per dollar, and yeah. now it's, it's gone up 4%. Yeah. Yeah. It rose way since the 70s. Yeah, it was a, sh very it was a bit like that college chart, actually. It sh really, yeah. really narrowed quickly, and then it's stagnated a bit. Yeah, I thought about that with the college chart. Yeah. Um, but one of my questions is, what, what explains that kind of stagnation, or that slower mm -hmm. increase since the 2000, 2000 mark? Yeah. And then also, when you look at an age, age group, women face more wage discrimination as they age, more so than men. So I, I don't know the evidence. OK. So my question is just, uh, could you help me understand that? All right. OK. Yeah. Great great question. So the wage discrimination uh, data is, is um, it's complex. <laughs> um, the basic story here is Claudia Golden is right. OK. For those who don't know who Claudia Golden is, she has a book called Work, Family, Career. When I uh, sent my book to review, one of my reviewers said, there's too much Claudia Golden in your book. I'm a massive Claudia Golden fan. Um, and so I didn't take any of Claudia Golden out of my book. I just didn't refer to her quite as much in the book. So it's a bit less like, as Claudia Golden says, as Claudia Golden says. I kept it in the footnotes. Anyway, guess what happened two weeks ago? Claudia Golden won a Nobel Prize in economics. So God darn it, I should have left all of Claudia Golden in the book. Right? I was right all along. I was, I was right all along. Isn't that a great feeling? Um, and what Claudia's work shows really very clearly, not only her, that the main reason for the stagnation in progress towards closing the gender gap is the difference in the care responsibilities on average between men and women and how that interacts with the labor market. Right? The labor market, workplaces, and particularly career trajectories have just not changed very much. They haven't changed enough. And so they're still hurting the carer more than the non-carer. And it turns out that especially in your 30s, what happens is that in your uh, roughly around the age of 30, you're between 30 and 40, you get these really big non-linear effects in terms of your earnings, right? You make, you get promoted, you make partner, you, whatever it is, right? And then it has lifetime effects. But guess what else people are typically doing in their 30s? And so Claudia's work shows that that as women just out of the labor market or not as strongly attached to the labor market during those critical years, that's the main reason for the gender pay gap. The second reason is the occupational segregation I referred to earlier, which is that these professions that are very and increasingly female dominated are not very well paid. Teaching, psychology, social work, etc. Now, are they not very well paid because they're female dominated? That's a difficult question to answer. But the fact remains that that explains another part of it. And then way, 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 way down the list is straightforward wage discrimination, right? So the story is really about the failure of the labor market to adapt. And that's why I think we just saw this jump in, in women's pay relative to men. So we're now up to 84 to the dollar. And we are at the highest level of uh, employment of women ever. And that the rise has been primarily among women with young children. This has happened in the last two or three years and a massive rise in the share of women in senior management. 
in the last two or three years. Why? What changed in the labor market in the last two or three years? Hmm? Uh, men came out of the labor market, they're coming back in. Now. Only, we're at 50% office occupancy from where we were before COVID. We've had a massive shock towards flexible working, allowing more parents to combine work and raising kids. And it turns out that has this massively positive effect on women's wages. Right? So like silver lining, there's a nice piece about that in the Times. And the thing that really, I think, underlines this point most strongly is the evidence we now have from same-sex couples. So in same-sex couples, and again, they're mostly women, you see a very similar trajectory for the wages of the carer versus the breadwinner. I'm just going to use those terms loosely for now, right? So typically, as a birth mother, typically, birth mother, right? The birth mother in a same-sex relationship suffers a similar wage penalty relative to her female partner as a straight woman does relative to her male partner. The difference is that in a same-sex couple, there's sometimes an alternation of being the birth mother. Right? So over the course of the relationship, you might be able to even it out. But you see very similar, this is Henrik Clevin's work and other people's work. And so it's super interesting and important because what that, what that tells us is this is not so much a straightforward gender sex story and more a carer, non-carer story. That suggests that if we're going to make more progress, which we need to, it's in reforming our labor market institutions, paid leave, better career tracks, organizations where more flexible working, more, more child care options, et cetera. We're at that point now where unless we reform our labor market institutions, it'll be slow going in terms of closing the gender pay gap because of this parenting penalty that so many women face. Thank you. This is weird. I'm going back now. <laughs> this is really low. Hi, Richard. I'm uh, Matthew Fisher. I'm a <coughs> hold this, uh, senior studying dairy science here on campus. So I'm a student. And coming from the student perspective, I just want to say I read your work. I really enjoyed it. And you have great ideas in this book. But my question for you is, as a student on campus and in an institution where we do have a majority of women here, mm -hmm. how can we as student leaders help promote the let's get to the 50-50, have the equal opportunities for both men and women to succeed in the classroom here on campus, because it's been a trend for falls for multiple years that we've been majority women, as mm. our data shows. Yeah. What are your ideas for, especially us young men here in the audience, that we can do to help support and promote this? Thank you. Um, my honest answer is I don't know. Um, because there haven't really been concerted attempts to change those trajectories yet, <coughs> let alone good evaluations of those attempts that would enable me to say with confidence, oh, that seems to work right, on college campuses. I've mentioned a bunch of other things that do work, that I feel very confident about. But in terms of like when, if you, if you say to me, like, okay, I get it, there's a problem. My men are dropping out a lot more, there's a problem. What do I do? I've said, have a men's resource center, as I've spent as a few, where there's mentoring opportunities, counseling opportunities, et cetera. Do I know that that will help? I don't. I don't. Nor, by the way, do we have very good evidence that women's resource centers are effective. Like, no one's doing randomized controlled trials of any of these things. But I think it would, at the very least, send an important signal and be a place to go. So I'd definitely do that. Um, a number of organizations now are just kind of creating task forces, creating mentoring groups, creating spaces where actually you know, men can talk to each other. Um, they're interesting. This was in a, I did a thing for CBS Sunday Morning. If anyone didn't see the segment, it's a really good summary of a lot of these arguments. And they've gone to the University of Vermont because I noticed that they, they have appointed someone to work on male achievement. He's in the Women and Gender Equity Center working on men. This is super interesting. Um, and, I, and, I, and he doesn't, they don't know what to do yet. So I think we're still at the stage, it's like back to this question about the wage gap. You want to understand like the causes before we can get to the solutions. But at the very least, I honestly think that just talking, admitting that it's something we care about, signaling that we're trying to work on it, getting the data, doing the research. Let's go ask the men. Like one of the things I did was when I found out the Kalamazoo Promise, a free college program, wasn't helping men, was go to Kalamazoo and talk to a bunch of men. And I report that in the book. 
I don't know whether what I found is really the answer, but at least I was asking the question. We're in the very foothills, I think, of this. And what I'd love to do is see more higher educational institutions come together around this, get some research done. I know a good think tank that could help do that work, in case anyone's <laughs> looking for a place to do it, and then see what works. Um, but I think w we've, until and unless enough people see it as a big enough problem to address, they won't be doing stuff about it that I can evaluate. So I know that's a really unsatisfactory answer, but it's the best I got for now. Please. Thanks. It's kind of weird that everyone's waiting back there. This is, a, this is quite a dramatic pause. It, feels, it? it feels really dramatic. Hi. I know, it's like, <laughs> it, 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 this has better be good. <laughs> the microphone's perfect for me, by the way. But um, <laughs> my name's Ann Lott, and I teach in the College of Arts and Sciences here, and I'm a mental health practitioner in the community. Thank you for being here and All discussing right, your you. work with us. There was an interesting uh, thought shift that happened when the chancellor did our land recognition acknowledgement and then talking about seeing the charts. Mm. Now, mind you, um, I'm in the humanities and I appreciate charts though, mm. but something came to mind and I wrote it down. Mm. Those who made and struck the matches wondering why the fire department is taking too long. So mm. where is the acknowledgement about colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism that are contributing to all this data? Mm -hmm. is, I'm curious where that is and why it is not being presented tonight. Well, <coughs> Can I just choose one of those? <laughs> okay, because I do think, uh, and I think I'll choose patriarchy if that's okay, um, because I think to try and do colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy would be too much, um, and I would feel ill-equipped, honestly, um, certainly on the colonialism point, despite my accent, um, uh, just as a scholar. Um, and on, on capitalism, I think it would be a longer conversation as to you know, what markets have, whether, whether markets have been good or bad for, for women in the US over the last 50 years. Um, but that's a different conversation. But as far as patriarchy is concerned, I think that's why the reaction to this work can be sort of deep, quite deeply rooted, uh, which is, it goes something, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that you said this, but it can go something like, that, wait, really? 10,000 years of patriarchy? We have a couple of years? where the guys are falling behind on college campus and suddenly it's a crisis that we have to address. Um, and so I just think it's important to acknowledge that, I mean, back in the spirit of acknowledgement, right, um, as to where we are, and to acknowledge the fact that we are still a very long way from moving away from that. The definition of patriarchy that I prefer, and there are lots of different definitions, the one I, I like best is that it's not a society where the men are above the women, as in all the men are above all the women, it's a society where a small group of men are above everybody else. Right? So if that's the definition of patriarchy, then we've still got a hell of a lot of work to do. Right? If you look at the apex of society. But that doesn't mean that for a lot of men, most men, that they're not in a society that, they f that is recognizably kind of patriarchal in that more horizontal way. So this may speak to your capitalism question too. Um, so I think in elite circles and at the apex, in terms of like who's running the world, <laughs> right, who's running these institutions, huge progress in higher education, huge progress in other areas, but is it still like very male skewed at the top of society? Yeah. I actually got into interesting legal battles for calling for quotas for women into Congress, because I'm European, so you know, we do that sort of stuff. And I was like, well, it's illegal, you can't do it, it's not really American, okay. Um, but I just think actually the lack of representation of women at the top of society has all kinds of downstream consequences. Acknowledgement, yes, but if we're allowed to think two thoughts at once, it can also be true that there are lots of measures now where just the gender gap does go the other way, and maybe that's a problem too. Um, and so that's how I would attempt to answer it, is to recognize our history, try to put data on our present, and find a way through this that's not zero sum, so that we can rise together. I don't it's taken quite a long time to convince ourselves that a world of struggling or oppressed women is actually not probably a very good world for men, even if they thought it was really not a good world. And, and neither is the opposite. So I don't like the term the future is female, for example. I didn't used to think about it at all. I don't like that term, because I've seen it through the eyes of struggling boys now. The future has to be for all of us. Is that difficult? Are there all kinds of complexities? Yeah, but I honestly believe that if you do it in the right spirit, we're gonna disagree about a lot of things. I'm wrong about a lot of things I've just said. I just don't know which ones they are yet. Um, and, and that spirit of progress for everybody, trying lifting everybody up together, then we'll be okay. Thank you for the question. 
And thank you for your work as a mental health professional. We appreciate it. Oh, all right, perfect. Are you, can everyone hear me all right? Should we move the mic back? Maybe. Or the people like this? forward? Forward or, or, <laughs> I don't know. This is, the choreography is very interesting. I think I put it there, actually, but I regret thank it you. now. Uh, I didn't actually coordinate this, but I got a uh, T-shirt today from the school council department here. So as a man going into a healing profession, I wanted to oh, take a you. chance to personally thank you for uh, your work and highlighting um, some, some thing, important things as well. Um, and I think kind of building off of the previous question a little bit, too, um, specifically on the capitalism piece as well, is I was wondering within your data and your work, um, how are you guys incorporating socioeconomic status mm. within um, some of the statistics that we're okay. seeing? Great, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Th doubly thank you, not only for your question, but for your work. Um, so, yeah, there is, I skipped that really, but um, it's a big part of our work. Um, there's a whole chapter of my book on it. Um, I did emphasize class. The gender gaps I've identified here, but more generally, they just get wider and wider as you go down the socioeconomic spectrum or on any measure, right? they're just wider. That's true, I've showed some stuff by race, and then obviously that intersects with class as well, but it's also true just for class, right? So some of the biggest gender gaps you see now in education, for example, are in low-income white communities, typically kind of rural. I, mean, I mentioned I live in East Tennessee now and I live in kind of northeast Tennessee, and so I'm interested in the data there, and you see such really big gender gaps. Now, the overall <laughs> achievement's not great either, but within that, you do see these kind of big gender gaps. So class and race are a big part of the story here in terms of like who's doing most effect. And you saw the wage chart as well, um, where it's at the top, so you see this wage inequality, like men in the top quintile, this is my last book, <laughs> um, pretty big wage growth. And then of course they're ending up typically with partners who are also doing very well, the women you saw up there. So household income inequality is really being, being driven by that story too. And so the story of economic inequality is also a story about gender, but not maybe in the way you always think about it. Not just the gender pay gap, but the household income gap between men who are continuing to see rising wages and women who've seen very fast rising wages, not to catch up with the men, but fast rising, forming households together. Meanwhile, Middle, this is my work from bookings before. The only reason that middle class households have seen any income rise at all over the last few decades is because of women. Women's increased earnings and women's increased, in, uh, increased earnings and employment. Middle class men have actually technically been a, a drag on middle class incomes, uh, which is a really difficult situation, I think. Um, and then you see the marriage trends and everything else I kind of just talked about. So, Long answer, but yes, class is the short version of it. Um, but these should be, to my mind, empirical questions. Let's go find out where these problems are greatest, right? By race, by class, by region, right? They, they should be empirical questions. We don't know in advance what we're going to find, or if we do, we shouldn't be looking, right? Back to my point about being a really bad social scientist, you already know what you're going to find. There's always promised evidence-based policy making, but very often what we get is policy-based evidence making. Right. Let's go find some evidence of the things, this thing's working. And you always can, especially now, you know, the era of the internet, you can find more. But I'll conclude with something I say in the book, which is I, that sort of gives me a little bit of hope because in low-income communities, poorer, poorer households, the boys, if anything, seem to struggle even more. Right. Poverty hurts boys a bit more than girls. It hurts everybody, but it hurts boys a bit more. It seems like a bit more sensitive, but just a bunch, right? That's a strong finding in the literature now, right? So you see that that way. So um, if you're really interested in economic inequality and upward mobility, you've got to be worried about boys and men. There's no difference in the upward mobility of black women and white women now. No. There is a massive difference in the upward mobility of black men and white men. All of the black-white gap in intergenerational mobility is explained by the men. All of it. And so if you're interested in inter upward mobility, economic mobility, you've got to be interested in race, but then you've got to be interested in gender as well. And it looks like it, you've got to really focus on black men. So this gives me hope because if you really care about economic inequality, you should be caring a lot more about boys and men. They're the ones being hurt most. They're the ones who are not being upwardly mobile. 
uh, or if you really claim to care about economic inequality and you don't think boys and men are part of the issue, I don't really think you're looking at the data correctly. That would be my assessment. But on the other hand, if you actually really do care about boys and men, you really need to care about economic inequality because they're the ones being hurt most by it. So maybe there's a hope for some sort of cross-partisan consensus there, right? Um, I don't know, but I'm an optimist. Thanks for the question. Yes? We've got to figure, figure this out. So my name is Bryce, and I am a student in the English Education Department here. Uh, and I'm wondering... My son's name is Bryce. <laughs> so. yeah, I'm wondering if there is anything that you think can happen in individual classrooms, particularly in like middle school and high school, mm. to help with the boy crisis? Or is it mostly things beyond individual classrooms and into the talking about getting more... And is it just the getting more... Um, men as teachers and more vocational stuff? Or is there anything that can be done at the hmm. classroom level? More like at day-to-day -day level, like in the classrooms as they exist now? Yes. Rather than, okay, great, thank you. Great question, Boris, thanks. Um, I don't know. Um, but I'll give some, s there's some suggestive evidence. Um, one of the reasons I would like to get more male teachers is because there just is some evidence that male behavior, and this is particularly true when you think about race as well, by the way, and the way in which boys of color and black boys especially um, are treated in the education system, is that actually men just appear to be a little bit less punitive around some of those behaviors, just instinctively. Like they're not being taught not to, but they're just, they seem to just sort of get it a bit more. Again, these are at the average, but it's a thin literature, to be honest. Um, but, I think there's a bunch of things we could do which would be disproportionately good for boys in the classroom, but also probably quite good for girls as well, or at least for some of them. So we have reduced the amount of time on recess. We do, uh, we have increased the amount of time they have to sit still. Some of that's about teaching to the test, etc. So I think we should break some of that up. I think we should start school later in the morning. And there is a recent study suggesting it would particularly help boys which perplexed me a little bit, right? First of all, why on earth we start, I mean, I'm, it's a whole different rant, but like the, the start times for high schools, it's unbelievably early, it's ridiculous, and it's really bad for teenagers. And anyway, um, it's insane and absurd and inexcusable. See, I said anyway, like I was gonna stop, but I didn't stop, did you notice that? Um, so I actually think starting school at a time that works better for adolescents would be a good idea, period, and it would help girls and it would help boys, but it looks like it would disproportionately help boys. Why? I don't know, but I'm going to suggest that it might be because the boys are struggling to get themselves to bed more than the girls the night before because their frontal cortex hasn't developed as much. Video gaming, I don't know, but it could be that the sleep thing is hurting them a bit more and the brutally insane time at which we start high school, is that too strong? <laughs> um, it, it's hurting boys a, a bit more. So things like that I think would, just would, would help boys uh, for sure. The last thing I'll say is extracurricular activities um, are hugely important for both girls and boys, but boys are doing them less than girls. And some school districts and states actually have a rule that if your GPA is below a certain line, you're not allowed to do extracurricular activities. Well, I showed you the GPA chart, right? If you say, unless you're getting a GPA of 2.5 or more, you can't do extracurricular, guess who's mostly being excluded from the extracurricular activities? The boys. And there's pretty strong evidence that they would benefit from them. And the lack of male teachers means that there are schools now who are struggling to find coaches. For reasons that we could debate, male teachers are more likely to be coaches, especially of boys' sports. Again, maybe a well duh statement. But what that means is that as you have fewer and fewer men in those schools, some of them are really struggling to find someone to coach the boys' soccer team, say. And that's, come back to the question about class, that's very much along class lines. That was not true in upper middle class neighborhoods. Depending on where we all live, maybe you're not seeing it. But if you go into lower income neighborhoods, you will see a, 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 a really strong deterioration in access to extracurricular activities, especially for boys. So I would love us to pay extracurricular activities much better than we currently do um, and to encourage more teachers to do it. That's also a reason to raise their salaries, which might be good anyway, might attract more men into the profession. But I think investment in extracurricular 
um, would be a big part of the story as well. That's a chance for me maybe to close because it comes back very nicely to where we started, which is a lot of these things are just good to do anyway. Will they disproportionately, in some cases, help boys? Yes. And is that, for my mind, as I look at the data, a reason to do it? Yes. So it should be seen as a feature of the policy, not a bug. In just the same way that if we see some policies that are really helping women, say in the labor market, much more than men, let's say paid leave policy turns out to help women more than men, is that a reason to not do it? No, that's a reason to do it. Because women are the ones who are still lagging men in the labor market. We can try and fix the education system so that it's more gender equal. And we need to fix the labor market so that it's more gender equal. Two wrongs don't make a right. We can do both at once. And given the trends I see for a lot of young men now, I think we need to get on with it. I don't think time is necessarily on our side here. And it's very important that, at the very least, some of the young men who I otherwise see finding other people to listen to online, if they don't feel like we're paying attention to them, that we don't make them feel seen, they might go and find someone who they think is making them feel seen. And we probably won't like who that person is. And so it's very important that we don't lose our young men, either most tragically, obviously they're in lives, but to despair or to drift or to reaction, which is what I'm afraid is going to happen if we fall down on the job. Uh, I see it happening already, and I think it's really important that we don't allow that to happen and just let them drift away. There are, not just for men and boys, but all together in our culture right now, just a few too many wagging fingers and not quite enough helping hands. Thank you.